morning. Amen. Let the neighbors here across the street. Oh, they tell me of a home far beyond the sky. Oh, they tell me of a home far away. Oh, they tell me of a home where no floor clouds rise. Oh, clouded day. Come on now. Oh, the land of cloudless day. Oh, the land of an unclouded sky. Oh, they tell me of a home where no storm clouds rise. Oh, they tell me of an unclouded day. Oh, they tell me of a home where my friends have gone. They tell me of that land far away Where the tree of life in eternal blue Sheds its fragrance through the unclouded day the king and his beauty there and they tell me that mine eyes shall be behold where he sits on the throne that is whiter than snow in that city that is made of gold oh the land of cloudless day oh the land of an unclouded sky oh they tell me of a home where no storm clouds rise. Oh, they tell me of an unclouded day. Oh, they tell me that he smiles on his children there, and his smiles drive our sorrows away. And they tell me that no tears ever come again in that lovely land of an unclouded day. Come on, last time. Oh, to that unclouded day, right? Uh, he's going to bust through that eastern sky and he's going to call the church home and we're going to go up like Superman. Amen? Don't No cape needed. And even this, this large vessel will be able to defy gravity. Isn't that wonderful? Y'all don't believe that, do you? I can tell. I can tell by your response. Yes, God can. With God, all things are possible. Uh, so, so even heavier set people. We're fearfully, wonderfully made. Sometimes we're made a little bigger than others. Good to have you, good to have you here this morning. We got uh, quite a few visitors from all over and we do appreciate. I do want to highlight real quick Dave Doolin and his wife. God bless you. And, uh, I hadn't seen Dave in a few years and, and he's looking good and, and his wife and, and I, I'm sorry. I know you remarried. Miss Sarah went on to be with, uh, in heaven and I, I didn't even ask your name. I'm, Vicky, God bless you, Miss Vicky. You have a beautiful smile, and and uh, you taking care of taking care of Dave is a full time job, isn't it? Amen. Amen. <laughs> uh, but uh, Nick and, and Jackie's back there too, and Chris and his wife, uh, assistant pastor at Eastside Chris Hill Eastside Baptist Church up in that's Chuck per Perkins Church uh, up in. Hey, mom, help her. We have kids in the service. Can you tell? She's a sweetie. Uh, and then we have a missionary, uh, Dublin, Ireland, over here. Where at the back? He's, oh, you moved over there. And his wife, God bless you. The Hognet, Hognet, Hognet family. Do you know him? He's in Ireland. You don't know him? He's independent, fundamental, King James, premillennial, hallelujah, big guy. Anyway. How, how, and then we've got an assistant pastor from, uh, uh, hold, on, hold on, Calvary Baptist Church up in, in, in Smithfield, uh, Virginia. We've got Smithfield, North Carolina, that's, that does hams too, and chickens and turkey. Amen. Y'all go like you go out in the is it is it like paper mill town? You go out in the Smithfield town, you smell ham. 
Wouldn't that be awesome? Somebody just, just cooking hands, all that. And, and uh, Brother Brian, is it? Is it? Uh, Dan, Daniel, Daniel. You're, you know, the Siri told me this could be Daniel. I've never met you. So I thought, wow, that's important. It offered me to put your name in my contacts. I can do that? God bless you. We got more. Uh, so, oh, we got all sorts of. So we, uh, uh, let's get through these. Let's see. Uh, Daniel and Rebecca Grant, from Shana, they're from Shenandoah too. And, uh, uh, and then uh, Dan and Elizabeth uh, Canavan, Canavan, does that say it right? That's a miracle, isn't it? Um, uh, Ellis and, uh, and Deborah Hunt, back in the back, on the back. They're mo new moves. So we, hey, really love on them. These visitors, who cares? You know, amen. These people, they're going to leave. They, they, hey, they're local, amen. Hug on them. Line their pockets there. Uh, uh, Allie and Trevor, where that? Right, and we didn't. I didn't get to meet you. God bless you. Now you here on your own, or, or did somebody invite you, or, or you just saw the church, or what? God bless you. Thank you for being here. And you're from Wilmington. Hey, Amen. You drove all the way from Wilmington to hear me preach. That's great. Well, this guy come from Dublin, Ireland. That's, that's that's impressive, isn't it? Uh, Caleb and Hannah. Oh, over here. There we go. That's you. That's uh, you didn't put assistant pastor. Are you looking at church? Is that why? Is that you? <laughs> uh, God bless the rest of you. Did I miss anybody? First time visitors? First time, God bless you. Well, we're going to pray. And we need to pray. Why? Because this world's a mess, isn't it? Uh, but we've got a God that can fix messes. It's amazing in the middle of tribulation and troubles of trials. And I'm not talking about pre-trib, post-trib. I'm talking about in the middle of just trials of life. Uh, God is the God that can just calm the seas. You know, when he was in the boat, they were all freaking out because of the storm, but he was in the bottom asleep. Why? Because he's the master. He's the master. Did, did you think, don't you think that Jesus in the bottom of the boat, he was like, hey, I just can't sleep. I just need to rock a little bit more. <laughs> I need some, how many of y'all sleep to, to rain sounds and stuff? He goes, oh, I need, he's, doop, doop. you know, we, we put on Siri or whatever. Says, Play me some, some rain sounds. <sighs> he's just falling asleep. Uh, but the but but the children, his children, just like us, we kind of freak out. But I know the master of the wind. Do you? I hope you know Jesus as your Savior. So let's pray, asking God. We're going to all pray together. You think a collective prayer is better than a single prayer? I think so. So let's all pray together. You can pray silently, pray uh, out loud. It doesn't matter. But let's ask the Lord. Uh, Father, in the name of Jesus, we're thankful that we have uh, you as our master as the one that guides and directs us. Thank you for these dear folks that are visiting with us, old friends. And Lord, we ask you to help us in the time of need. I know uh, all of us have some something probably in their life that uh, we're concerned about, we're praying about. We do pray for healing for our friends and uh, families. And, and Lord, uh, those that are hurting for loss of loved ones. Uh, Lord, uh, I ask you, God, just touch today that our hearts would be softened by the message and Lord the music and uh, would you minister to us also we pray for our guests and those who are ministering in other churches that their needs would be met uh, spiritually financially uh, uh, even psychologically God help us to keep our mind stayed on you Lord I pray the teenagers to um, to the adults to, to the young the old Lord we all get what we need this morning help us to worship you in spirit and truth in Jesus' name we ask and pray. Amen. Turn around and just wave at each other. We try not to spread too much. It is allergy seasons. restrooms if you don't know that they're down the hallway to the right and uh, if you want to escape just let the security know we do have security uh, that are armed and dangerous they all have the shakes <laughs> no, uh, uh, with 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 all these preachers here how many preachers I know Chris and you preacher here the preacher the pre the pre you look like preachers with beards are better amen <laughs> uh, sorry brother I'm just I'm, I'm beer profiling, but uh, I, I, 
if you come back tonight, I'll let you all preach. How about that? You know, I just sometimes want to, I want to hear other preachers, but I can't. I've got a message. I don't know why God let me write because it's kind of odd. Uh, I'm, I'm going to preach on Ish, Ishbosheth. Have you ever heard of Ishbosheth? Uh, I think I'm, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, it's Saul's son, another one of Saul's son. It's odd when God, does he ever, does he ever do that to you? God says, preaches. I'm like, no, there's a better, yeah, there's, there's an easier story. And, uh, and then the thought here is, is uh, if, if you know the story, if you, you, most of you are probably not familiar. I, I, I'm not trying to uh, make you feel bad, but you'll find out that there was, a, there was two guys, two brothers, looking, they, they were looking for favor from the king the wrong way. They were looking for reward. They were looking for something. They were going to the king and trying to provide, give the king something that they thought that the king wanted, but it was wrong. Isn't that terrible? Think, don't, have you ever you ever bought something for somebody and, and you just heard them say something and you're like, well, I didn't want that. It's going to be a tough message, I can tell. Amen. <laughs> We're going to preach on Zacchaeus again today, okay? We're just, <laughs> he, I'm just going to sing the song. We'll go home. Does that be all right? Uh, <laughs> I do. I do want to give you an update real quick. Cross street, the building. We could potentially be. Uh, we could have the CEO this week. So we're waiting on just uh, with a piece of piece of metal and and uh, uh, just putting a toilet back on the thing. We found out that uh, uh, the 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 um, inspector uh, was misinformed and told us that it was wrong and it was right and so that was a blessing but uh, uh so but we do need your, we need your help we do have something else that's come come uh, arose uh, uh sidetrack is the the drainage ditch over here if y'all drive over there you see the big uh, we're, we're creating lake wakatuki hole the uh, the the sauna it's getting bigger and bigger we have a pipe that has rusted out uh, drainage tile and we're going to need to get that fixed or repaired uh to replace it all uh one quote's nine grand so we're, I'm going on debutation starting this week, and we're going to ask. <laughs> well, we got a couple of churches here. Uh, uh, by the way, I'm Chris Wittock. I'm a missionary at the Bible Baptist Church. <laughs> we're, we need some help. <laughs> I like that. We can do that. Y'all, you're, you're laughing. Well, anyway, um, but uh, pray about that. I don't know. It would be great. We could probably do it ourselves. That's what we would do, about $4,000. Uh, but again, the four thousand dollars is four thousand dollars. Some of y'all have that in your account. You don't even know you have it. You're like, you have it in a shoebox somewhere. Uh, some of y'all have it in back tithes. Can I get an amen? <laughs> right. But uh, anyway, well, I'm glad that you're here. Uh, Mamma is at home. Uh, she broke her hip Thursday morning at two thirty in the morning, and she came home yesterday. Amen. It's amazing how quick they want you to get out of the hospital. They're so scared of COVID at at, at uh, Cape Fear that when I went and I pick, went to carry Leslie. Uh, uh, some clothes, and I, I had to use restroom. I went in, and the guy was kind of sitting in the chair, and he said, you have a mask? I said, no. He, raw hands, bald hands. He just grabs the mask. Here you go. He's so scared of COVID at the hospital. Y'all y'all have y'all have a problem with that? I'm so scared of COVID. you got to wear a mask, but I'm going to use my nasty, stinky hands. I pick my boogers and scratch my back, and I'm going to hand it to you. Is it just me that sees a little problem with that? Anyway, did I kill it, preachers? Did I kill it? I don't know. Uh, wear a mask if you want to. It's all right. Uh, let's sing again. Let's, let, let me just let me hush. Let's do that. I'm surprised Leslie hadn't started playing yet. I'm in a weird mood. Let's stand. Uh, my Jesus, I love thee.
Leslie sing it, uh, but one thing I've learned, and some of these preachers can probably, I think, would agree with me, as you minister with people, that people, people don't really know what biblical love is anymore. They don't know what love is. They think love is a uh, uh, is something tingly feeling, and it makes you. Uh, love is consistent; it never faileth. Love is uh, thinketh not its, of itself; it, it behaveth it, itself not unseemly. Um, you know, love, biblical love in First Corinthians 13 is, is what this, um, this love that we ought to have with God. And, and uh, unfortunately, our society thinks love is just, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pay you off. So uh, I know this, you'd say, is that an awkward time to talk about offering? Uh, don't ever think that putting your money in the offering um, is, you're, you're paying, you're giving God his rent. Uh, you know, something you owe him in the sense, and that he and expect uh, that he's supposed to bless you. Tithes is your our, is our duty Amen. as a believer, as a Christian, as local fellowship is our belief is is it's our duty. God God expects us to do that. Our offerings is above and beyond that. So you give an offering, and so where does God bless us? He doesn't bless us on just doing our duty. He blesses us on uh, giving our offering. So you give an offering for a faith promise. You give your offering for. Uh, uh, for a drainage ditch, you give an offering just because you want to, uh, but that's where God blesses you. But unfortunately, we don't understand what love is. We love ourselves. We go give ourselves an offering. I've made this statement before, and you, you can say amen. 20 bucks seems a lot to throw in the offering, but it's nothing when you go to McDonald's. I wish I could get in and out of McDonald's with my family for $20. Somebody say amen. Hey. Like, man, that McDonald's, $8 for a Happy Meal? I mean, for well, it's a Happy Meal that makes me happy. I know you can get the little Happy Meal. Mom got that one the other day. I ordered her, and she got a prize, too. We got a little, little thing of fries. I mean, just, yeah. Uh, but, but, again, the greatest offering God wants is ourself. He don't want our attitude. He wants herself. And I hope that you'll be willing to. To do that. Brother Ken, would you pray for us? Father, we love you. We thank you so much for another opportunity to be in your house. Father, we thank you so much for the blessings of the week. Father, each and every person today should have a burden for the lost souls in this world. But Father, you know what's on our dear pastor's mind. He's got a lot on his plate. And Lord, I wish we as a congregation people within the sound of my voice would sincerely pray for this man of God that stand firmly on your word. Unless you write us out, Lord, we've been so blessed to have such a great man of God. In December will be 20 years. What a vision. What a testimony. Him and his family, not only do they talk the talk, but they walk the walk. Father, we thank you so much that you blessed us with so many visitors today. Father, you knew as you started time that today would be a day that you would make that hopefully we as Christians would rejoice and be glad in it. Father, I pray most of all today with the congregation of this size if there's somebody here today, Lord, that doesn't know you on a first-name basis, Father, I pray your will would be done, that a new name would be written down in glory. Father, we thank you for our Sunday school teachers. Thank you for their dedication, their testimony, their yes. studying of your word. Yes, Lord. As you tell us, Lord, to study, to show our self-approved. Now, Father, as we come to this time of the service, Father, you know you've always met our needs. But Father, we pray at this moment that if no one in this house 
has nothing to give financially, Lord, that they would give more of their time and their talents. Because, Father, all you need is our availability. <laughs> Teach us and train us to be more like you each and every day. Be with our dear pastor as we break bread. Yes, it's a tough message, but Lord, you brought him to it. We'll get through it. We love you, Lord. For it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. a change offering up from the kids so we dig you dig deep into your wallets for change or paper uh, this offering goes towards our uh, scholarship for school so if you'd like to give the kids can come and get that before they go to junior church all right here we go amen hey Paige Paige go in my office and give me a water There you go. Oh boy. have always got it, just about it. every now and again a guy get it oh bless you bless you all right junior church can be dismissed kelly's got it today uh so ages four to eight you can go or if you really don't want to be in here you can go <laughs> okay. i see a lot of boys there's one girl two girls three girls Leslie sings uh, two things. One, uh, I was reminded reading Oswald Chambers this week is that prayer, uh, we, we talk about working for the Lord, but prayer is the greater work. And in order for, for you and I to ever understand our purpose on this in this life, we've got to learn to pray. And, and prayer can be a, a, a you know, citing a list of, of requests and things, but I think it's much deeper than that. I think you do need to do those things so you can remember. I mean, I, nobody has a memory like they need it as you get older. But, but uh, I'm, uh, what I'm what I'm suggesting is prayer ought to be something that a communication with God that's never it says pray without ceasing. You, you never stops. You're everything you do. Lord, where do I need to eat? Lord, where do I need to listen to? Lord, the kids drive me nuts. Help me, Jesus. You know that those. They have a, such a communication. And uh, before you say, well, I, I'm, I'm there, be careful of that because I think we all need to grow in uh, intimacy of prayer uh, with the Lord. So, um, and then the second thing before we sing, uh, our, our vision, my, the vision that we have for this year is seeing Him who's invisible. As we get the new church, uh, our new building open, it's the kitchen and all that in the open area uh, for you that are visiting. It's the desire to... Uh, uh, develop our school uh, larger. Uh, it's a desire to uh, have bigger youth ministry. Um, and uh, I, I'll, I'll go ahead and tell you, Tony has, is interested in helping with the youth. He's talked with me, and we're talking a little bit about that. And I know some of you others of you have talked about that, would help help with that. But uh, 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 that's the desire, is the shift where we could, can you imagine, I mentioned this before, having you know, 100 kids over there in that building. And... Um, and so we would need all your prescriptions uh, to to help help the teachers there. But uh, it'd be nice to get master clubs uh, back started back. And some of you know know what that is. It's like an Awana uh, club on Wednesday nights. But we need people that are dedicated. 
and people that have good testimonies. We can find people, put them in the class, but what if you, you have a bad testimony? What if you, you have something in your life that people know about? And that's, you're teaching your kids that, teaching the kids. So, so let's all work on our testimonies. Let's all get faithful. Let's all get dedicated. Let's all, let's use the altar. Let's, let's show that we, uh, I, I think, how, how do Christians show that they're Christian uh, other than just going to church? I think they have to be active. They have to be vocal. They have to be, uh, in, in your decision making, your your kindness, your love, you're talking to people. I I just think that um, I think the message this morning maybe it'll it'll come more clearly. But uh, those those two brothers were trying to trying to get favor from the king the wrong way, and, and I think that's the danger in our churches today. We want favor from God the wrong way, and we'll we'll deal with that a little bit more. Okay. I'm going to talk a minute. Oh, okay. As you can tell, he can talk, right? <laughs> I think that's wonderful. You know, uh, sitting here watching him, listening to him, that's a pastor. Amen. That's a pastor. He's got visions. He's got ideas. And I, I know that uh, there's a few preachers in here, visiting preachers, and their wives are here. You can say they're constantly thinking, aren't they, ladies? They're thinking of how, how can we do this? How can we get some new ideas? Well, October's Pastor Appreciation Month. or I, I found out it was supposed to be on one day, but I always celebrate the whole month. And I'm married to my pastor. Amen, ladies? Amen. Yeah, so what do We're you do? <laughs> so a few years ago, I wrote this song, and I wanted it to be for him, but I, the more I wrote it, the more I wanted y'all to know what I see that y'all don't see. So this, I'm going to sing my song for him. And for you pastor's wives out there. You don't ever see the stress that he's under. You don't ever see the tears behind his smile. You don't even know the burdens that he carries Or those times he stays awake through some nights From your pastor's wife's heart You don't see what she sees The love of the shepherd he has for his sheep don't ever take for granted the man of her dreams. Sincerely, from your pastor's wife's heart. Did you know he has to give account for you? Do you know all the hours that he's preparing? And before the throne of God he goes for you. From your pastor's wife's heart, you don't see what she sees. The love of the shepherd he has for his sheep. Don't ever take for granted the man of her dreams. Sincerely, from your pastor's wife's heart. On another road he was on, but he was chosen. It's a calling from on high He cannot explain What a privilege To preach the gospel story For one day the crown of glory Will be His From your pastor's wife's heart 
You don't see what she sees The love of the shepherd That he has for his sheep Don't ever take for granted The man of my dreams Sincerely From your pastor's wife's heart Sincerely From your pastor's wife's heart She, uh, 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 holding back tears, you know what I mean? Uh, there, it is, it can be difficult, uh, as we pastor, and you know this, uh, preachers, to, to, uh, fulfill a vision for the church, uh, because you can only go as fast as the people want to go, the sheep. Uh, first 10 years I was here, I, I, uh, was zippity doo dah, and uh, it's, as they say, zeal without knowledge. Then you get a little older, and you got some knowledge, and then your zeal's gone. And uh, that's where I'm at now. After herniating disc and just can't go in, and all sorts of little issues. Uh, but I, I, you know, I can complain about health issues, but I can really say this: is that God limit. That's how God had to deal with me to delegate, to let this be our church and not Pastor Chris's church. Be our ministry and have your ministry within the church and so that you can anchor into the church. I was I made the mistake of, for years of using uh, the people to build the church when I need to use the church to build the people. And uh, I, I'm, I'm trying to correct that. It's a hard thing to do when things need to get done. But uh, in in, in in trying, you know, studying in the early years and, and looking behind some great men of God that built works, they inadvertently or I, I took from their, uh, their educating style that that's what you did. Man, you just, you got a hold of people and you're supposed to, they love God and if you love God, we're all supposed to do the work. Amen? They don't work that way all the time. <laughs> uh, so you have, to, you, you have to love the people and the results up to God. Uh, you see, in my early years, uh, I always equated, and, and, and I'll say for this, most people equate success with bigness or, or, or fineness. Where, In other words, you, you can go to a church that's smaller, but everything's done elegantly. Everything's just it's high quality. And people say, oh, yeah, they must be. Wow, ah, wow. Uh, just like I mentioned that church uh, that I read about, they run about 200 people, and they uh, they raise five hundred eighty-seven thousand dollars for missions. We think, man, they're wow. They must have a lot of money. No, they just could be spiritual. <laughs> they just could love God enough that they, everybody. Did you know if if everybody in our church tithed, just tithed, we could double or triple our missions. We could take on a couple staff members. Amen. But that's that's life. But so what do you do? You work with what you've got. You love the sheep that you have. And I was at a, a thrift store yesterday. Shepherd wanted to stop in. He. He's looking for a bass guitar. Anybody have a bass guitar they don't want to use? Uh, he's wanting to learn that. And uh, he's back there. In the, and, and they had a uh, they had a sheepskin like I have my office. Uh, Y'all watch Sheffy. I got a sheepskin, lambskin. And uh, that was a church member that got killed. A amen. And uh, well, I was at this thrift store, and they had a real one. So I don't know if they're open today, not advocate shop on Sunday, but, you know, it's that, that, that castaways up on 130. Uh, he has 25 bucks on it. I was tempted to buy it because my uh, lamb skin was, I think, $125 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Uh, and I, I just got to th just thinking about how about sheep and about as sheep as God relates us to, sh to sheep, that sheep can't see very good. That's why the shepherd has to. They say they can only see about not. Nine inches in front of their face. <clears throat> so the sheep that the, the sheep that follow the shepherd the closest gets the best best grazing field, gets the stillest water. They 
they, I remember Don Harold coming and preaching. He said sheep loved, they want to lay down. They want to lay down. But, but you know, the psalmist said, He maketh me to lay down in green pastures, where a sheep, if, they're not, if they don't have a shepherd, lay down in thickets and briars and, 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 and mud pits and all that. I don't know if y'all have seen on the internet over the years, uh, there's been a few of them I've seen where uh, sheep get out and they, they, they're, not, they're not trimmed and they have this, you know, 100 pounds of wool on them and they can't hardly eat or do anything. They're dying and they need somebody. They need somebody to help them. Uh, but Don Harrell used to say too that sheep's follow goats buck. And so there's a lot of goats in the church that pretend to be ge- sheep. Uh, we're blessed that we don't have a lot of uh, vocal bu- uh, goats. They don't, they, they're, not, they're not vocally bucking, but they, they, they buck in the way of not following the vision that the church... Uh, when God sends you to a church, why does He send you to a church? He sends you to a church to be a part of that vision in order, in order to reach the lost, educate and disciple the, the, the saved, and love on, love on everybody, be a family, be rooted and grounded. If you're looking for a church that's going to be perfect, or uh, uh, you ain't, uh, ain't going to be here. <laughs> uh, you're looking for a pastor that's always... Uh, pastor Appreciation Month, and I don't mean this ugly, but... Uh, you know, people always, they want to encourage the preachers. and sp- But I'm not all that. I'm not. Uh, but I do love the people. Uh, so in other words, I say that people come and they get mad because I tell them the truth. They get mad because they don't like how I say it. I've had people leave. I don't like how you said that. Well, so I'm supposed to change who I am because you don't like it? Or do you call me enemy because I, I you, you call me, count me as an enemy because I tell you the truth? Apostle Paul said that. So uh, I, I don't mind listening to uh, suggestions on how to pastor, but don't mess with my preaching. Amen. Well, that'll really get exciting. Uh, hallelujahs. Uh, <laughs> I want you to turn to 2 Samuel uh, chapter 4. 2 Samuel chapter 4. Uh, we're facing real battles in our lives, and what the devil's trying to do is the devil's trying to take stuff like COVID and mask and and, and, and social thing, you know, all the, the government and saying they're, they're trying to take that and divide the, the, the church, get us mad at each other, shame each other, uh, making the problem each other rather than the problem of the devil lying to you. And the devil does lie. He's a, he's a deceiver. Uh, and he's an accuser of the brethren too, by the way. Oh, you do, you know. You know, when you hear people, it's, it's lessening now, but when the, when the COVID first hit, when someone said they had the sniffles, everybody's like... <gasps> It's amazing how how the devil can deceive the world to make something be something that it's not. I watched a program, and I, I, I need to labor this just a little bit because it's on me. Uh, it was on YouTube. It's probably not there anymore. Uh, Netherlands, the, there was doctors, a group of doctors come out in the Netherlands, and they said, they said COVID is a flu. like We now know. They said we now know that COVID is like a flu-like virus. It's not as deadly as they say it is. I say, well, man, how could everybody? And why is some still? Because fear creates control. Fear creates control. I try it all the time. I preach, man, I try to treat you. Hey, you're going to go to hell or you're losing rewards and trying to, so I can control you to get you where you need to be. And uh, some people, huh? Is he still preaching? I, I, yesterday I went to the, the Lowe's and bought a, a, a blower, and one of the blowers had, I've never seen this before, most of them you just turn them on, there, you know. This one had a switch where you could go high and you can go down. I think that's how a lot of people have in their ears. They have this where they can hear, they turn the hearing aids on or just they turn them off. I'm not picking on you that have hearing aids. I'm just saying, I'm not interested in this. I'm not. Well, the problems that we have, I think the main problems most of them deal with doing what's right. What's the right thing to do? What is the right thing to do? Is it the right thing to go to church? Yes. Is it the right thing to do church every time we meet together? Yes. Is it the right thing to tithe? Yes. Right thing to witness? Yes. Right thing to dress right? Yes. Right thing to, to be friendly? Yes. Right thing to uh, confess uh, your sin to God? Yes. Is it the right thing to use altar? Yes. Is it the right thing to sing during church? Yes. Is it the right thing to be interested, have devotions? Yes. Is it the right thing? Why do we have to tell that to believers? Because it's becoming more and more difficult to de- 
define what is right and what is wrong. Because people decide, we're see, I'm seeing it uh, in present time, current, I mean live, I'm seeing it live, where, where people will have actually, tell me things that they, that, uh, things they're not doing right and they justify it as right. And what do you do about that? You let God deal with them. Because I believe that, that church isn't like a business if you didn't do right when I was in the, in the culinary and you didn't, you didn't perform, you didn't show up, you didn't dress right, you didn't, you didn't create, you, you had sorry uh, preparation skills, you didn't, do the, you didn't do what the job called for, uh, you get reprimanded, right? And if you didn't change at that repr being reprimanded, you would be let go. But church is not that way. Church is not a business in that sense. It is the work of God. It is the, uh, Jesus went about to do the Father's business, but that business is not uh, ma uh, managed the same way in the sense that if you're not doing God's business, I'm supposed to let you go. Or maybe we should. How would you feel if that was our duty that every pastor, if you're not doing your part, you just say, hit the road, Jack. Go find another church that's doing nothing that you don't want to do, you fill in right in. And there's, there's pastors that do that. But as an under-shepherd, I want to try to cultivate and motivate and engage. It. Let's find out what's right again. Let's find out what's right again. The text I'm dealing with today is a, is a part of a bigger story, and some of you are familiar with that. It's not often preached on. I don't think I've ever, in, in all the years that I've preached, ever uh, preached on Ishbosheth uh, and, and these men, but uh, this particular story in 2 Samuel chapter 4 deals with them looking for favor, looking for a reward uh, from the king in a wrong way. Now, I'll go ahead and say uh, that this is a transitional time where Saul was uh, Saul had died, and he was the king, but we know that David had been anointed king far be before that, but he hadn't taken the position. In chapter 5, you'll read that he did take the position, but I want you to understand, David is the king that God chose, amen? And these brothers that we're going to get to, Rahab and Badnon, they decided that we want, we want to take it upon ourselves uh, to go do something for the king. I think he wants done. But the king never said to do it. The king never told them to do it. But they did it anyway. And they thought it was the right thing in their own mind. And we'll, we'll, we'll see that. But it cost them their lives. How often do we, we as people of God seek the king's favor? How often do you seek the king's favor? Is it wrong to seek the king's favor? Mary found favor in the sight of God. Is it wrong to seek favor? No, it's not. I'm not, no true question. There's nothing wrong with seeking favor. I think God wants us every day to seek favor from Him, but the right way, not the wrong way. It is terrible to think that we as a church struggle with what's right, what's evil, opposed to what's, uh, what's spiritual. It's terrible to think that people are justifying their sins and saying God will accept this and God will reward me and God's going to bless me because I'm doing what I think is right in my eye. That's what the king really wants. And the king never said it that way. How often do we seek favor? When you do seek favor, I want to encourage you to make sure you seek it the right way. One commentator that I was reading behind uh, said this chapter is about doing wrong, thinking that it's right. He said, upon the death of Saul, Ishbosheth attempted to rule all the tribes. So Ishbosheth is a, a name you don't hear often. Uh, uh, but uh, he's, at, he's at the center of this. The tribe of Judah refused allegiance. And then with Abner as general, and you can read this in chapter number uh, three about all that, and Abner dying, Ishbosheth set up a capital east of the Jordan, uh, Jordan River uh, as, as a, after a stormy career, listen to this, during which Abner deserted him, Ishbosheth was murdered by two of his own henchmen, Rahab and Bana, who took his head to David at Hebron, expecting a reward. 
However, David's sense of justice led to the execution of these two criminals and the burial of the head of Ishbosheth at Hebron. Uh, this event marked the end of Saul's brief dynasty. You understand something that uh, a lot of times we think that we're, it's, a, it's a right thing to do. A lot of times it's, we think it's the, the proper thing to do. A lot of times we think it's going to benefit God or benefit maybe a leader or a parent or even the preacher, but you best make sure it's the right thing. Let me just simplify it real quick. It's kind of like saying, preacher, I'm going on a carnival cruise and gambling and all the proceeds I'm going to tithe. Hey, devil had it long enough, right? I, I, it's, it's justifying wrong thinking because it's okay. It helped people, didn't it? You steal money and you tithe off that? If Ishbosheth was a prince but wanted to be king, he was a son of Saul. Uh, he, he wanted to live the royal life without responsibilities. How do we know that? It, 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 we'll, we'll get into it in just a second. But I wonder how many church folks are like that today. They, they, they are, uh, we're children of the king. We're princes, if you will. Uh, we want to live the royal life. We want to live the life that uh, described, I'm, I'm, I'm going to heaven, I'm sealed, uh, sanctified, uh, serving. But you don't want to take the responsibility as a Christian, as a prince, as, as a child of God, if you will. Ishbosheth was like that. Saul was, he, he got it honest. Right? Don't want that response to Rahab and Bana were brothers that were liars. They were murderers and totally disconnected from what the king really wanted. Now, it sounds like many others in this world, doesn't it? They're, they're liars, they're murderers, disconnected from what reality is. Just like over 40%, I believe, of America is on the left, far left, and crazy agendas and, and killing babies and, and just, uh, uh, hey, legalizing marijuana and just uh, let's take that, let's defund the police and all this. It's absolutely nuts, isn't it? Absolutely crazy. They're, they're from the same place as, uh, they're from Baroth. Did you know that the, Baroth was one of the four cities of the Hittites which entered by fraud into a league with Joshua? They were raised in a, a climate of deception and so these kids were raised in a bad place and they, they got to be the henchmen of Ishbosheth, but turned, turned their back on him and ultimately killed him, shoved a knife in the, uh, under the fifth rib and took his head off? Man, you never do that, right? I wonder how many people are killing people with their eyes, with their attitudes. Then we have King David, a man of war, the Bible says. Yet, yet understood, you don't kill God's anointed. First Chronicles 16, 22, King David said, Touch not mine anointed, and do my prophets no harm. You, you see what these two men were doing. They were taking it in their own mind. I'm going to do with what I want. There's people today, I'm going to take my tithe money, and I'm going to help the little old lady across the street. That's not how God said it. I'm going to take my offering. You can give offerings to different people. I understand that. Some people say, well, I'm going to stay at home and watch, watch it on. That, hey, if you're able to come here, you're not supposed to be at the house. Amen. There's people doing what they think is right in their own eyes, only going to kill people. It's going to kill their faith, kill their, their, uh, kill their love for others. It's going to kill compassion. It's going to kill it all. You see, when our society allows for sin at any level, it creates more sin. How can the church get so liberal? We just let sin in. Let sin in. You let standards go. How would, how would Bible Baptist Church be if you pastored it right now? You're not here all the time. You're, you don't give. You, you don't care about the ministries. You don't even care if the waters or the plants are watered. There's no prayer. We have pre-service prayer. Nobody, you know, we have five or six men show up, maybe seven or eight. But women, I don't know how many on that side. If, if you were in leadership, what would you do different? You see, I'm under the impression if you're saved, you have the Holy Ghost inside. Amen? You have the Holy Ghost inside, that same Holy Ghost is going to convict me the same way He convicts you. How we respond to it is different. Some people respond quicker. Some people's a little hard-headed. You know, I tend to be more of a hard-headed. I admit it to you. But I think we ought to respond. 
The Bible tells us, we see it in our churches with attendance where they justify a lack of attendance, lack of witnessing, lack of giving. In James 1, 5, it says, Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. We must be careful in how we seek favor from the king because we're, I'm seeing it more and more. In the last, last few years, I'm seeing it more and more at Bible Baptist Church. And, and when I go out and travel and I preach revivals and they sing, I, I hear it from the pastors there, is that the people are, are now designing their own own platform of religion, their own justification, the way they dress, the way they, they're forming their own religion. They believe in God, but they deny the power thereof. And shouldn't there be an amen somewhere around there? They believe in God, but they deny the power thereof. From such turn away, I believe I'm quoting Bible. I told the, the teenagers today, and, and uh, I, I just want to tell you that I... I, I I come across this program. It was on YouTube. It was, I think it, A&E shows it, but it's uh, Scared Straight. It has profanity in it. I don't advocate that. I normally don't watch it, but it's talking about teenage kids. I'm trying to learn how to try to help figure out what is it, how you fix these kids. How many of you all ever seen that Scared Straight? So some of you, what that, what that is, is these kids, their attitude, and they're doing it their own way and stuff, they put them in, they put them in jail for a day. And they're screaming at them. I mean, the police officers, then they bring the inmates in, and they're just, they're, they're beating them down. Not, not physically, but verbally. They're beating them, they break them, they make new exercise, do all this stuff. And by the end of the day, they're crying, and they're, they realize. And they, then they go in and they talk to them. And I'm thinking, what was the problem with those kids? It's mom and dad. Because you know what? They responded to discipline. They responded to the fear of going to jail and being somebody's wife. They responded to that. But when they, when they, when they let them leave, uh, there's the parents going, baby, I'm so sorry, baby, I'm sorry, you know, I'm sorry. And they're going to go right back into the same job. And they'll, they'll give a little update and they said, uh, he's mostly stopped drinking and mostly stopped smoking pot. Mostly. Mostly, you think of these two brothers raised in a bad place, a place of deception, a place where lying was normal, a place where uh, deception was on the rampage, a place where, where killing others is, is common. It's a bad place. And what makes it even more horrible is Rahab and Bana took a life but yet lost their own life seeking the favor or reward from the king. Now today, do I think anybody here is going to kill somebody? No, not, not literally physically, but I believe killing their spirit, their desire to serve the Lord. You see... All we have is each other. We look at each other. You examine everybody just like I do. You pay attention to certain people. And young people especially, they're looking for other, they're looking for the weakest link and they're going to follow and they're going to say, I'll watch them. They're doing what's right. They're here. But why are they here at church? Why are they attending? Could, could they have an agenda that's not pure? Could they have a, a mentality in their mind thinking that, uh, that I'm here, Lord, and buddy, you better, you better bless me. You will suffer as well if you think this way. If you seek favor from the king without understanding, uh, number one, the king's love for the enemy. The king had a love for the enemy. We're going to read 2 Samuel chapter 4 and verse 1. It said, when, when Saul's son, this is Ishbosheth. Ishbosheth. Most of us uh, know of Jonathan. We know of Mephibosheth. But uh, and I, if, if I had to do it all again, I think I'd name at least a dog Mephibosheth. Isn't that just a fun name to say? Mephibosheth. Everybody say Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth. It's just, I just think Ishbosheth is just, you know. But uh, when Saul's uh, son heard that Abner was dead in Hebron, his hands were feeble, and, and the Israelites were troubled, and Saul's son had two men that were captains of the bands. The name of the one was Bana, and the name of the other was Rechab, the sons of Rima. Uh, a bear, uh, Barothite, the children of Benjamin, for Bereth also was reckoned to, J to Benjamin. And the Barothites fled to Gideon and were sojourners until this day. Now listen, verse 4. And Jonathan's son Saul had a son that was lame at his feet. He was five years old, and when tidings came with Saul and Jonathan out of Israel... 
Uh, and his nurse took him up and fled and came across. And as she made haste, that, that he fell and became lame. And his name was Mephibosheth. Now, I, as I study the scriptures, I find it interesting that in the midst of this, this murder story is, is a little blip of Mephibosheth. It just tells us that he got lame. He tells us that he was, he was Ishbosheth's brother. Why would, why would God... Uh, stick this right in there. Well, if we study the show ourselves approved, we realize God sticks this note about Mephibosheth to declare uh, uh, once again David's love for yet his enemy. David loved Saul. David loved Jonathan as his own. David loved Ishbosheth. David loved uh, uh, loved Jonathan. He, he loved Mephibosheth. In 2 Samuel chapter 9 and verse 1, And David said, Is there yet any that is left in the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? In verse 13, So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he did eat continually at the king's table uh, and was lame on both his feet. And you've preached it, I've preached it, we've heard it, uh, that hey, you can be lame, you can be without, you can be a cast out, you can be a part of a, a terrible family, but uh, hey, you get right with the king and you can eat at his table all the days of his life. He ate with the king. The problem that Rahab and Bana had was this, and we have these problems at times too, is we're trying to seek the favor of God. We're trying to seek the favor of the king, and we don't even know, we don't even realize the king's love is in me. The brothers wanted favor, reward from the king, and failed to know how to treat the king's en enemies. Don't you just hate it when people try to do something you think that th they think that you like? That was real quiet. Why is that? I mean, they, they could have brought, I'll give you an option. They could have brought Ishbosheth to him, couldn't they? They could have gone into Ishbosheth's uh, palace at noonday and said, Come on, man, I'm taking you to the king. Because, you know, we're, we're under the impression that, you know, David's at war with Saul and, and you know, they're killing people. So I'm gonna, we're going to take it over ourselves. Uh, they could have said, well, let's just take him to the king. Let the king handle it. Let the king handle the enemies. Let God handle the enemy. A vengeance is mine. I will repay, say the Lord. Touch not. Uh, don't touch him. Uh, but no, they decided to say, I'm going to do it the way I think I want to do it because this is the way I, I'm a liar and I'm a murderer. And let's go in deceitfully by day and take him out. All for the king. They didn't want the king to deal with them. It's amazing what people do that is sin, thinking that God approves of it. God approves of this. God understands. I hear that, and it makes me nauseous. You know how dangerous it is to, to let your default reasoning be God understands? Uh, yeah, God understands that you should do better. God understands that you should be studying to show thyself approved. God understands that you should be witnessing. The Holy Ghost has dwelt inside of you. The circumcision has taken place. You're supposed to be walking in the Spirit, not in the flesh. God does not understand your sin. God does not understand you wanting to stay in it. Why? Because His Son died for it. His Son's blood is just shed for it. You should be doing what God wants you to do, not what you think. What are, what are what people do today that think is, are they ha hating the Jews? Uh, we don't have that here, but there's places that Christians sit up in church and they hate Jews. The blacks? Well, there's a whole lot of churches like that. And, and black is a, is a nice word. But they, they hate the blacks? Oh, oh, God's approves of that. There's people I know that think that the black people are cursed. We're cursed. Huh? We're all fearfully wonderful to me. How about, how about people that hold grudges? And this is where I got you all, right? I ain't no people hate Jews in here. I ain't no people hate blacks in here. But uh, what about them grudges? What about them grudges? Oh, yeah. Don't like what, how they say it, when they said it, what they meant by it. Just hold grudges. How do you know you're holding grudges? So from a pastoral point of view, if I've asked you to do something and you refuse, you're holding a grudge. If I preach the truth, right? You read your Bible and you read the Bible, you need to do this and that, and God the Holy Ghost says this is what you and you don't. You're 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 whole, you're, grud, you're you're grud, begrudgingly, I guess is the way you say you're resistant, stubborn. Stubbornness is the sin of witchcraft. 
Now think about this. These brothers wanted favor. But Jesus said in Matthew 5, 43, Ye have heard it has been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. This is what they, they were hearing. But Jesus uh, made it crystal clear. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them which despitefully use you and, pers and persecute you. That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh the sun to rise on the evil and on the good and sendeth rain on the, pun, uh, on the just and the unjust. So what was, what was their mistake? They, they, there was the mistake of wanting to seek favor from the Lord? No, absolutely not. I hope every believer wants to seek favor from God. They want God's reward. They want to, uh, well done, thy good and faithful servant, enter now into the joy of the Lord. You know, you've been faithful in a few things. I'll make you ruler over many. Now think about this. Not, nothing wrong seeking that favor. Nothing wrong with seeking that reward. But where do they go wrong? Uh, they, they took it upon their own hands of what God was looking for and they didn't take into account the king's love for the enemy. So they automatically defaulted to their carnal nature and said, well, the king's at war with them. The king must want them dead. We're going to go do it. The king didn't ask us to kill them. The king didn't ask us to go get them. I'm going to go. We're going to go. Let's go. They cohorted together. They lied to themselves. And that's what people do too. Church, man, Baptists are bad about that. They'll find somebody to justify their reasoning. You'll find you want to do something sinful, you, you, I guarantee you. you. want to go smoke dope today? There's somebody here to say, okay, let's go. Uh, you don't want to come back to church today? Somebody go to dinner with you right at church time. Today. There'll be somebody here. Oh, well, you know, I got... If God understands. You show me the book where He does. So here we find these brothers uh, did not take into account, they didn't take into account that God, the king's love for the enemy, although they're the enemy of God, although they're against God, although they've caused trouble to, uh, to, to David and issues, let God, let the king deal with them. They were, going to, they were looking for the king's favor, under, understanding this, uh, not understanding. He, you, you never, they never knew uh, you never can do the king's job. Uh, they, they, went, they went, took it in their hands, and they didn't understand that you can never do the king's job. I can't save people. You can't, I can't even fix people. I, I've got a history, and every pastor in here, I, I don't want to speak for you, but I, I hope you'd be honest and say, if anybody got fixed in our ministries, it ain't me that fixed them. Maybe I led you to the physician. Uh, maybe I told you the right recipe to, uh, to, to whip up prayer and fasting and seeking God, repentance, but God's the one that fixes you. See, these Rechab and, and Bana, they thought within themselves, hey, I can do the king's job for them. The king don't need to mess with this. I'm going to go do what, what the king wants. The problem was they didn't know what the king wanted. They justified within themselves, and it was bad. It was wanted to be one thing if they went and got Ishbosheth and brought him to the king, but they didn't go get Ishbosheth. They went to where he lived at noonday. Uh, they they d d d were deceptive. They lied and said, We're here for wheat. And they went in and killed him. I don't know about you, but stabbing somebody with a knife is bad enough, but then they went back and cut his head off. Verse 5 And the sons of Ramah, Berethite, Rechab, and Benah. Uh, went and came out of the heat of the day in the house of Ishbeth, who lay on the bed at noon. That's where he was. He was prince that wasn't responsibility. See, at noontime, he's laying around. Hello. And there came thither into the midst of the house as though they had fetched wheat. That's where they, they got into. The, uh, some scholars said they had to lie to the soldiers. They had to lie to the guards. Or the guards were sleeping with them. But they said they came with the pretense. Hey, we're coming to get some wheat. Is it ever right to lie? To kill somebody? <laughs> Hello. So, and, and they smote him under the fifth rib, and Achab and, and Bana, his brother, escaped. For when they came into the house, they lay, uh, he lay on the bed of his bedchamber, and they smote him, and slew him, and beheaded him, and took his head, and, and got away through the, through the plain all night. So, now think about the effort that these two men had, and this is what's so sad. We would today probably say, well, they meant well. <laughs> I mean, you know, look at the effort. And this wasn't like going across the street. This wasn't, they, they, it, it took them all night to get back to David. And it wasn't like they had a nice car. They had Uber drivers. You know. They didn't have a Tesla. Oh, they, they had they, camels or horseback or maybe walk. 
And it wasn't like they, they were just going freehanded. Now in their hand, they, they've, got, they've got a head bleeding nasty. And are you talking about how seared conscience you would? I don't know about you, but I can't handle horror stuff. I don't like that. I don't want to see blood and guts. And ah. So what was it? They, they thought they could do the king's job. They brought, brought death to a life thinking it was result in favor. They brought death to a life thinking it would bring them reward and a better life. And wh- why is it we, we, we do what we do for God? It should be for the thought that, will I have a better life? And I think if you do right, if you figure out what God loves, and He loves the enemy, and you don't kill your enemy, you love them to, you love them to death, if you will, put it like that, uh, but you love them and you don't kill them, uh, what do you do? You don't do the king's job, you let God do His job, and, and you just be the one, the servant of the Lord. And, and they, they, had, they had energy, they had motivation, they had time, they had money to be able to travel all this way, but they thought they could do the king's job and they thought they'd have a better life but they were mistaken weren't they eternal rewards are not given when we do what we think is right did you hear me eternal rewards are not given when we do what we think is right you ever met people I don't know if they're saved you just hope they say well I have church at home well, what about the Bible says not to forsake the assembly of so, Oh, no, no, no. no. Well, I, I just have church at home. I, I can serve my God at home just as well as I can at church. You can't fellowship as well either. Who do you tithe to? What work? What's your vision? How many people are you soul winning? Hello? I, I've, I've met so many people. I remember one lady at Eyeglass. She, she said, she said, I asked her if she goes to church. She said, no, she goes, I, I'm... I'm a believer, but I, I, we have a home church. That's because the Bible talks about home church. I said, well, yeah, and actually they, met, they went from house to house. Hello, not just your house. And then I asked her this, and I let alone, I said, what happens when your house gets too small to accommodate the people? What do you do? Well, they've never had that problem. Why? Because they don't want it that big. It's us four no more. You know, what, you know what they did in, in the early years when, when the houses got too small to accommodate the people? They built churches. Hello? Tabernacle was bigger. Temple was bigger than a house. But you, you see, there's good people. I'm not saying they're lost. I'm saying they have justified something that I believe is wrong. It's not biblical. And they think, hey, I'm doing all right. And I'm doing, hey, they're, they're, they're doing what they think is right. They think they're going to get eternal rewards. Now think about especially taking a life. Especially taking a life. They, Rachab and Benna said, I, I'm going to take a life. And the king's supposed to reward me. David called Ishbosheth in, in the next few verses a righteous person. He called him a righteous person. He wasn't a righteous person in the sight of God in the sense because he had, he had sin in his life. But to David... He was a righteous person. We can't save the lost. We can't, we can't alter Bible doctrine to justify sinful actions. We, we can't. How many in here justify people in your life telling other people that they're saved all because you know they prayed a prayer at eight years old or they were baptized? How many people do we have? How many moms and dads? How, you're still claiming that my babies are saved because at four or five or six or ten years old they prayed a prayer and they lived like hell. They haven't, their life hadn't changed or they're an open, unconfessed sin and you're saying you're saved, you're saved. Friend, yet you're doing exactly what they're doing. If you're saying, you can't live, I'm telling you, I'm telling you. What were the two people, Ananias and Sapphira? They just lied. Wow. They just lied and they did boom. And what was bad, you know, when somebody drops dead, there's a commotion, right? And you know, they rolled him up and took him out in a commotion and here comes, I believe the, his wife comes second and and Peter said, why have you lied to the Holy Ghost? Hey, the men that just took out your husband are going to come take you out. It may have been vice versa. They both died. Why do we want to justify? Why do we want to do the king's job and tell, tell our loved ones they're saved when they're living like hell? Better check up. 
Because you can go through life and say, Mama, please tell me I'm saved again. Daddy, please tell me I'm saved. Can you please fax me a picture of that, my baptismal certificate? I think I'm okay, God. I'm all right, Lord. Uh, please, uh, I, I got saved at an early age, but I haven't done nothing for God. I robbed God. I don't lie. I, I don't uh, tell witness. I don't do anything for God. I just come up in church and I didn't demand a reward. So it's dangerous doing the work of the king, isn't it? Only God can save. Only God can convict. And let God take whoever needs to be out. Take it. Let Him take it out. I've said if, uh, if a man, a woman, boy or girl, can talk someone else into salvation, a man, woman, boy or girl can talk them out. If God gets a hold of your heart, God does it for all eternity. Now, we have low times, don't we? All Christians, you have low times. We have times when we're a little sketchy. Some of our attitudes is growing. But there's conviction. There's a lot of times when I fall into uh, some sins of attitude and actions. And Boy, I, it's amazing. I, I even say, Lord, I, I bounce back and I'm a stronger believer than when I was before. Can I do it again? No, 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 no. You ever read Romans 6? What shall we say? When sin abounds, grace doth much more abound. And they said, well, should we sin the more that grace? He said, no, by... No, 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 no. But that's our God. I'm troubled by church members that are trying to, trying to do the, the work of God. We can't save people. We can't, we can't help them without God. Um, our work is to inform. Listen to this very carefully. Our work is to inform. It, it is to warn and it is to love, and it is to shine for Christ. My father-in-law said that his daddy, his, his dad, Carl Osborne, was, Pharaoh was a fourth generation preacher. And his, his dad said, I think it was him that said this, as you said, Pharaoh, you got to love them to death, tell them the truth, and if they want to die and go to hell, that's on them. But Rechab and ben have said, no, I'm going to do the job of the king. I'm going to go take him out. I'm going to go do this. I'm going to go do this. For the, I'm going to do this. And we know what happens. The brothers took it to an extreme and took a life. There are some that may not kill others, but they, they're beat down uh, by, uh, by sinful justification. They're beat down by religious uh, uh, attitudes that are uh, legalistic and, and they take quality of life. You, you get Now you think about it, if you can mark your kids as soon as they get 18, they're out of the church, then you're, you've done something wrong as a parent. It stings, doesn't it? Now, it's not a blanket statement. There are exceptions. But I'm telling you as the pastor, I'm telling you as your pastor, if you're seeing signals from your children that are not biblical, you better get on it. You better talk to them. Don't let this say, oh, it'll pass. It's, it don't work that way. How foolish can you be to think that, that somebody else has got into your, your children's mind and has perverted their thinking about Bible and you're just going to let it happen. There was another family at our church. They've left the Stevens family. They uh, they went. Uh, the, the kids went and got involved in open theism. Open theism is a teaching that says that God doesn't know everything and God's ever learning. And so it ju that justified uh, their their way of living. And so well, God didn't know about it, so it's okay. We'll do it. God didn't know about it, it's okay. And you know what? It has corrupted that whole family. Is absolutely corrupted that whole family. Parents did not jump on it. They let them get into anime that perverted cartoons and, and they all dressed up in, in like hoochie mamas and makeup and weird, an alternative lifestyle. And some people think that that's okay. You know, in the last days, men shall be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. When, when, when woe unto them, Isaiah 5, woe unto them they call evil good and good evil. What were the problems of Rachel? And they, they were trying, they, they thought they were uh, doing right. How many times have you sat around the table with your sibling and said, you know what? That guy's causing a problem at the church and making the preacher really upset. I'm going to go over there tomorrow. Come on. We'll take him out. And it kind of inclines, I don't know, preacher, we can talk about it later, maybe. It kind of inclines that they went in first and they jabbed him in the rib. 
And then it said, it just may have just been a, a more explanatory when it, it says that he, and said they come back and they cut his head off. Maybe they dragged him in his rib and they walked out and they said, maybe he went dead. Let's go back. You think God cut his head off? Yeah, that's biblical. David slew Goliath. Let's go do it. I, I'm, I'm being trying to be funny, but think about how 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 twisted. Someone can be to say, hey, hey, there's, there's someone that I honor and respect that can reward me, and I think this is what they would want. So I think they would want me to murder somebody in the, in the, in the, in the midday, broad daylight, just murder them, cut their head off, and, and travel all night and present it to me, thinking that they're going to get rewarded for it. Doing the king's job. Wow. It's sad, isn't it? They were seeking favor. A reward from the king. And you know what they, they did wrong to? The last thing, and we're done. I'm sure you'll probably say, Amen. I am. This is one of these messages I'm, I'm ready to get through. They brought the king the wrong thing. I, I can say this. I, I'm hit. There's been times when, when my family, maybe some of y'all, you bring me a gift that I don't want. Some of y'all might be, you know, a 30-day trial at, at the gym. Some of it may be a tool <laughs> to do a work that you don't want to do. You know, don't buy me a rake. <laughs> if you want to buy me a tractor, I'll accept it. I will show you favor. <laughs> For one bucket, though, you know, just... But have you ever had gifts like that? And you're like, the gift comes in, you're like... Thank you. That's not what I asked for. You know? I, I, that's not what I asked for. They, you know, you, you mentioned you needed a pair of shoes and they went to Walmart. And I got them on sale for $5 on the rack. Well, thank you. I've had people over the years, they don't do any more thank you. The, the thank you don't do it. They buy me a suit before I even try it on. That, for, for these little preachers here, no, no no offense, but you know, normal sized preachers, that's fine. You buy stuff off the rack. Me, it's like, you know, you got to go to El Gordo. You know, you got to El Gordo like a baby. You got to go to the, the heavy, heavy duty beauty section. And, and then you got to take, got to get something to wrap around this thing. Amen. One time someone gave me a, a gift to, and I'm not trying to be ungrateful. I'm just trying to be funny, I guess, to ease this point. Uh, they gave me a, a gift certificate for, I think it was $200 to, to Men's Warehouse. Men's Warehouse is built for little guys. And I call everything smaller than me little. So, you know, <laughs> uh, so I go up to Men's Warehouse and I'm like, man, you got anything to fit me? The guy's like, well, hold on, let me go back here. <laughs> Come on. And they, he, goes, he goes, yeah, these three right here. I said, like, well, let me try it on. And I put it on, and I was like, oh, my, praise Jesus. Wow. You ever put on a good suit? You ever put on, not like, you know, the belt, you know, the $69 one on sale or the thrift store. I don't, can't buy them at the thrift store. But I put on, I said, wow, man. Oh, that's great. Oh, that's great. Woo! <laughs> that is great. $5.99. I said, sorry, I only got $200. People mean well at times. You mean well at times that you bring the wrong gift to God. Let me read it. It says, And they brought the head <laughs> of Ishbosheth. They brought the head of unto king, unto David, to Hebron, and, and said to the king, Behold, the head of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, thine enemy. <clears throat> now this is where they start, they start ad-libbing what they, their mind. Though, they said, which sought thy life. They didn't know whether or not he sought the life. And the Lord hath avenged my Lord, and, 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 and the Lord the King, this saw David and, and his seed. And so they got spiritual, didn't they? And David answered Rachab and Ben and his brothers, the sons of Ramah, the Berethite, and said unto them, As the Lord liveth, and who hath, who hath redeemed my soul out of the adversity, who hath re redeemed my soul out of all adversity. Let me stop and just say, don't have a lot of time. You know what David just said? 
David is preparing to tell them, you dummies, I don't need you to deliver me. God has already delivered me. The king, the king of kings has already delivered me. What have you done? What are you doing? Are you foolish? He says, the Lord hath delivered me. As the Lord liveth, who hath redeemed my soul out of all adversity, when one told me, saying, Behold, Saul is dead, thinking to have brought good tidings, I took hold of him and slew him in Ziglag, who, brought, who thought that I would have given him a reward for this tidings. Oh. You think Rechab and Ben-Hadad thought about that? Man, we go and get a reward. But then the ball drops. How much more when... How, what does he call them? Wicked men. S have slain a righteous person in his own house upon his bed. Shall I not therefore, shall I not therefore require his blood at, of your hand and take away, take you away from the earth? And David commanded his young men and they slew him and cut off their hands and feet and hanged them. Uh, up over the pool of Hebron, but they took the head of Ishbosheth and buried it in the sepulcher of Abner in Hebron. You know what they brought to David? You say, well, they brought a head. No, they brought an attitude. Some of y'all still have it. Some, you, you look at me and you have the attitude. I was watching that, that scared straight and a little girl, a little 16-year-old girl, pot smoker loose in her living and she she started out she's like by the end of that show she was crying and by the end of your life you're going to be crying you keep on doing what you're doing Amen. they brought the king attitude they brought the king assumption well i just assumed you want that aren't you at war with king saul well, don't you don't you want the enemies i just assumed and they brought a dead head. Come on. I mean, it, it, is there any circumstances in your life that you want somebody to bring you a head? Oh, man, oh, what a present. Man, that's going to look good on my counter. Hey, whoop, whoop, you know, hey. I'm serious. Even in those times and even those days, why would, the, why would David want Ishbosheth, someone that he called a righteous person, why would he want his head? Well, when you're foolish and you're not thinking about how the, think, the, the, the king thinks, you're going to do what you want to do, what you think. They would want it as a trophy. They would want to put it in their house. Look what I did. Look what I've done. Many within the church, many within the Christian faith think God blesses them when it's the devil blinding them by false provision. Don't you think the devil will provide for you just to get by? Don't you think the devil will ease up just so you can just make your bills and so you can just say, well, I just, I'm going to stay in, I'm going to stay doing what I want to do. I'm going to do the king's job. I'm going to just do it the way I want to do it. And I'm, I'm going to, you know, hey, just so that he keeps you blind. There's some blind people in here today. There's some people in here today that, that made professions before, but you can, I can see it on your face now. You ain't nowhere near God. God ain't nowhere near you. You're no more bit interested in this as if, it was, if I was talking theoretical physics, whatever that is. I'm in church. Here it is. I'm here. I'm in the church today, Jesus. Where's my reward? I brought my family. I, I've sucked the life out of all week and denying God, denying the Bible and not, not serving the Lord. I've sucked the life out of them. Come on, God. Give me reward. Come on, man. Oh, that's a democratic statement. Sorry. I gave $20 today. Now I better get a raise. I better get a deal uh, on something new I don't need. Been watching hoarders too, by the way. I'm sorry. Forgive me. You know what their problem is? They, they have connection to junk rather than God. The brothers allowed carnal thinking to take, down, take them down a dark path of deception and ultimately death. Have you ever thought about why the younger generation is so liberal, so spiritually dead? They're raised by people that never brought the right thing to the king. 
Am I talking about you? I don't know. Are you that parent? That you bring you bring to church the wrong thing every week. If you come. If you come. If you come. You don't bring joy. You don't bring forgiveness. You don't bring an earnestness to learn. You don't bring repentance. You, you don't bring any type of, hey, can I add to this at all? You, oh, yeah, you've justified things, and you say, well, I'm doing this, and I'm doing this, and I'm doing this. Oh, I work security, or I, or I work in the nursery. or whatever. Come on, are you kidding me? That's your duty. What have you brought to God? Do you see what's happening? When, when parents and adults, as we go to church every week, and we bring the wrong thing to the king every week, we bring our attitudes, we bring our assumptions, we bring death. We don't want to lively in the service up. We're not looking at how can I add to this service to make God pleased. It's more like, I, I can't wait till he shuts up so I can go home. I sit there and critique how, you know, he doesn't pronounce that right or he doesn't have a four-point outline with subpoints or whatever. When the younger generation is so liberal, we're seeing it. If the children could see the parents just bring themselves as a living sacrifice, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove that which is good, except the perfect will of God. You see, what, what the children need to see, what my children, what my wife needs to see me, is that although I may not like the situations I'm in now, maybe I have burdens on me, but she still needs to see me come to church and I give myself. I'm not trying to drag in some dead head. I'm not trying to drag in assumptions why I shouldn't do or why I shouldn't come back. I'm not coming in, coming in uh, with lies and, and all that. I'm coming in giving myself as a living sacrifice, holy, except one of God. I, I want to repent. I want to get right. I don't want to live the rest of the day or the rest of the hour in the same mind frame that I come in. Ishbosheth was murdered. Why? Because two brothers wanted a reward from the king, but they failed to understand the king loves his enemies. They thought that they could do the king's job, and then they brought the wrong thing to him. You, could you imagine the story would be different if they said, Hey, king. I brought Ishbosheth here. I've heard he's been against you for a while. You do with him what you want. I think the story would be different, wouldn't it? The king would have said, Well done. And you know what I believe King David would have done? Just as we learned with Mephibosheth. Come here. You've done me wrong, but I love you. Come get up my table. Come on. Come on. Pull, pull up in table and let's, let's dine. Let's, let's dine together. Friend, I'm not your enemy. And I don't want to be your enemy. I don't, I don't want to have to look in the congregation and see people that are uh, di dis disengaged and, and just do, going through motions. It doesn't help you. It doesn't help us. It doesn't help the church. I want to see people that, that are doing the right thing because they know it's the right thing. Even though it's hard. It's hard to do the right thing sometimes. It is. It is more convenient to do the wrong thing at times. It is more convenient not to tell the truth. It is more convenient to lie to yourself. It is more convenient to spend your money on something over here rather than doing what's right, giving towards the new building or missions or whatever. It is, the, it is convenient that way, but it's not the right thing to do. Church, I want us to pray together that we, we're, we don't become like these two brothers. What were they doing? They were misinformed. They were blinded. And they were hurting others. I don't want... I have heard recently, in the last months, there are people that's left this church and they look back and they've been hurt by this church. I don't, I don't want that. Now, people may get hurt because they we're telling the truth. I understand that. But I'm telling you, a lot of the hurt is because... Is, is that when truth hurts coming from a different person, it's because they haven't heard it coming from the right person all their life. In other words, if I didn't hear a truth growing up, if, if mom didn't spank me or ground me or, or discipline me growing up, then when I got, when I got older uh, and, and, and the law comes in and disciplines me and jails me, then I'd be all up, let's defund the police. Hello? When there's no consequences... Chaos will, will result. We have to ask ourselves, are we bringing the right sacrifice to God? 
Are we, are we really doing what's right? Would you please stand? With your heads bowed and eyes closed. Visitors, we had revival two weeks ago. And God moved in. Since then, we've seen three professions of faith. Older man got assurance of salvation. But I know what's happening is that the devil is doing all he can and he's whispering in our ears and saying, you know, I know this wouldn't normally be accepted in church, but now it is. I'm telling you it's okay because it's because of COVID or because of, uh, it's okay. It's just okay. But I'm pleading with you. That's all I can do. Come, let us reason together, saith the Lord. God's saying, come on. The altar's open. Maybe you could come and pray for me. Because I want to be in the center of God's will. I want to be able to help. The moment I can't help Bible Baptist Church is the moment I've got to go. I can't stay and not help people. I, I, I want to help people. Get, get away from their justification of their, of their living and, and how they're, 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 they're telling their kids it's me. It's that church. It's that doctrine. Rachab and Banna, they said the same thing. Oh, well, David would want us to kill him. Da da David would want a head and an attitude and an assumption. David would want that. The king would want it. They never took the time to find out what the king wanted. Never understood that let the king do his job. They never understood of what the king needed from them. I beseech you therefore, brethren, Romans 12, 1, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Folks are on the altar. Maybe you need to come. Maybe you need to sit where you're at. But is there anybody here to lift their hand and say, Preacher, God's dealt with me on whatever this morning. God has dealt with me. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Yes, ma'am, I see your hand. Anybody else? Anybody here said, Preacher Chris, I need to be saved. I need to rededicate my life. I need to, I need to do business with God. I need some help. I, I won't call you up here, but I'll, I'll meet with you after church. Anybody in here that says, I need to be saved, I need to rededicate my life, would you slip your hand up? Slip your hand up. Salvation is free, and that's what's interesting is that we want to make salvation is just a prayer. Uh, salvation is not praying a prayer. Salvation is not just words that you utter out just so you can get your go to heaven free card. Don't be misunderstood. Don't let the devil blind you. Salvation is a turn, a change of heart. It's a turning, a repentance from your way to God's way. It's an acknowledgement to God. Uh, do you have to say, Lord, I'm a sinner and I forgive you my sins and come into my heart? No, my friend. You don't have to say, the Bible says, whoever call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It doesn't say specifics, but I know this, that the specific things that must take place is you do know you're a sinner. You do know you're, you owe a sin that, and you do know, need Jesus to, to save you. And what if you're backslid? Because sin does that. Sin blinds you and blinds you. Sin gives you an attitude. Sin gives you an assumption. And sin will ultimately bring forth death. You see what they did. When love has conceived, it brings forth sin, and when sin is finished, it brings forth death. Guess what sin did? Sin brought death. Brought, brought Ishpazeth's death. It brought Rahab, uh, Rachab and Benah's death. It brought death to that family. It brought death, uh, more death. And David was trying to prevent that death. David wanted, wanted to, uh, Saul killed, he could have killed him in the cave. But he knew better. Touch not the thou anointed. Church, would you pray this morning and ask the Lord Jesus to soften my heart as your pastor? And maybe if you pray that, you can pray to ask God to soften yours. That we may be the children of the Almighty God. Wanting to see, wanting to do, wanting to live a life that's acceptable in the sight of God. We just have a few more days of labor. You agree with that? It could be a year, it could be a week, it could be an hour, it could be a minute. And let us labor together for the Master from the dawn till setting sun. And I encourage you to do all you can to honor the Lord. And I hope you will.
appreciate the hills and appreciate all the, we got hills here and hills there. There's hills everywhere. Uh, all the folks from different churches. And, uh, we're meeting back tonight at six. If you're able to come, I hope you will. But uh, I know some of you are on vacation, you're traveling and stuff. Be safe. And uh, we'll, we'll see you again in the air. Amen. Brother Chris, would you dismiss us?